Okay, so that was an aside on payday quantification that we need to keep in mind when we try and use it. You didn't answer the question. What? You said, what? The question I often get is this, and then what is the answer. No? Yeah. There are some sources where you can get this data. So the Welkin do have reconstructions for um, available now. I mean, they, they had for, for, for like a couple of years. They had coming soon. They had reconstructions. It's a bit hollow soon. Yeah, yeah. So now, now you've got should be five thousand last station maximum, and uh, I can't remember what well, other. Has they've got like three or four the last interventions? Yeah. Um, there are, there's a, the paleoclimate model in compar in, into comparison project, PMIP, and there's actually been four or three versions of this now, and uh, if you look for PMIP, um, there's a website, well there's actually three or four websites. Yeah, it's very been obscure with this Five year tranches with the different um, <laughs> data sets, but the more recent data isn't released yet, so uh, here might be two, the data is available. But again, these are paleoclimate reconstructions designed for climatologists who are interested in this, and they're not, they're not pre-packaged ready for um, uh, niche modelers. So you tend to need to do a little bit of work to turn them into something that's usable for our sorts of modelling. And the, the, the ideal situation is you befriend a uh, paleoclimatologist who's doing work in your area and then get them to run models for you that are specific to you. Okay. As, as ever, collaboration is, is good for you. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk a, a bit about modelling. So uh, the, first, the, the first kind of modelling is the sort of direct analogue to our uh, um, transfer it into um, uh, the future, we just transfer our models into the past. Yeah. So just as just as before, we would use our favourite um, modelling algorithms to develop a <coughs> model using the same methodology, you know, constraints that we've been talking about for the past two days. And once we have a good model, we then try to project that model into our um, um, paleoclimate layers. And using that, we would then examine our suitable areas and compare that to the present day distribution. And ideally, if we've got uh, if we've got uh, our species and we've got fossil evidence for that species, we can use our fossil observations to try to validate our model. So here's a, uh, an example: Enrique Martinez Meyer and uh, Town and uh, I can't remember who else is on this. Uh, they looked at uh, reconstruction. I can't remember what species this is. Um, but uh, here's the present day distribution, and they built their um, they built their model uh, based on this present day distribution. And the green area is a, a binary prediction of presence. And they projected this into paleoclimate reconstruction for the Pleistocene. Okay. And um, as it happens, they had five uh, good fossil um, records from this time period that they could use to try to validate their model. The little blue line here is the limit of the ice sheet according to the reconstruction. Okay, and you can see the red is the area that they predicted as suitable. So four of the five points are within this suitable area, and one is outside. Okay. So, simple. Build your model as usual, but then you project into a paleoclimate reconstruction. Yeah? But it, it works like in the future that the variables must be the same at present and in the future. For instance, if you use mean temperature and then mean temperature in yes. 2015, is, is this the same? Yes, obviously you need, to, you need to use a set of variables that you have for the present day, and the equivalent set of variables that you use for the past. Um, and that's because uh, obviously you can't do the cross projection if you don't have the same environment. So it, it, this can be restrictive in that the 
number of layers and the information that you have for the present is more detailed and basically you just have more data available for the present. And the uh, uh, paleo climate reconstructions tend to be limited to uh, uh, climatic variables. So you've got your, your sort of standard biofilm sort of variables tend to be available. Whether the seasonality are uh, available. The species that you modeled in the present is uh, not the same, it's just uh, it's the same species? Yes. So, so here's the occurrence records for this species in the present. And they've got fossil evidence for the same species in the past. Okay, so these are the same species and this is the, the model for that species if projected it's into a If the fossil plant. species is extinct, it's uh, fossil or it's Logical to use just uh, related species? Could be, or it's not. Uh, yeah, so. Um, if it's extinct, you don't have the present distribution. Yeah. So that that then becomes difficult. You can't, you can't model a uh, extinct species using present day data. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was yeah. suggesting so that we're a related species. Like a yeah, so um, here you're, you're assuming. Uh, a level of conservatism, <coughs> assuming that this is closely related species. But if you've got good fossil evidence for your extinct species and you've got paleoclimate reconstruction, then why not do the model directly in the uh, in paleoclimate? And that's something we're going to talk about. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, there's many similarities with our transfer into future climate reconstructions. We build our model, we project it into an atemporal reconstruction. We can examine multiple reconstructions. So again, um, just as a feed, there's hundreds of future climate reconstructions for the same time period. You know, ideally we should have multiple reconstructions for our paleoclimate scenario. Try to project into all of those, or as many as we can get our hands on, and look at the, the impact of the different climate reconstructions have on our, the area that we select as, as suitable. Okay, and then we should try to, if we can, try and uh, document the uncertainty based on the paleoclimate reconstructions. And then we should compare it to present-day distributions, so we can talk about where where we're suitable in the past against where we're suitable now and you can think about what the dispersal potential would be between those different areas. Okay? And so these are exactly the same considerations we have when we're thinking about um, uh, transfers into future climate reconstructions. Okay? But although there are lots of similarities, there are some differences uh, that we need to keep in mind. There's a great diff time difference between our model build and our projections. Okay? Greater time leads to greater uncertainties. Um, we've got additional uncertainties about paleoclimate reconstruction, so we're not as sure about those because they are further back in time. We tend to have lower resolution paleoclimate reconstructions. Remember yesterday we were talking about the impact that lower resolution climate data has on our models. We tend to, generally speaking, we tend to over predict when we have coarser grids. Um, and the other important issue, as uh, Rob was uh, shown earlier from Townsworth, the further back in time we, we go, the greater the opportunity for adaptation. So perhaps our assumption of niche conservatism might be violated. So that although we project an area, our fossil records don't match, that, that might actually be some evidence of um, adaptation. Or it might just tell us we've got a bad model. Okay. But the other important difference between future um, um, models and higher um, models is that then we have an opportunity to validate. We can validate our higher climate reconstructions and we can validate our models if we've got fossil evidence or pollen evidence or you know so there, are, there are other kinds of indirect evidence that tell us that our species was here or not. Okay? But 
really important. Try, try and get this kind of evidence if you can, because that will give you, that will give you a means of validating your models and giving you a better certainty of, 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 of what you're doing is, is half decent. So I've got a couple of examples. Um, this 2006 uh, one, of course, so um, I think Tam was in this one as well. Um, what they did was looked at a bunch of um, uh, tree, uh, tree species in the Amazon, and they developed present-day models for each of these species. Okay? And then they projected each of these models into reconstructions of the last spatial maximum. So here, the model for the present, distribution for the present, projected into the last spatial maximum paleoclimate reconstruction. Okay? <coughs> and the sort of area was shown in dark and light, so we've got these massive patches of presently suitable area that we don't think were suitable at, uh, at the last spatial maximum, so uh, 18,000, 20,000 years ago. Okay? The same here, this big patch, and again this big patch has been unsuitable where it is in the present. When we look at this, what do you notice? Squares. Yeah, so you have these massive big squares. What do we think this is? Resolution. Yeah. So this is, this is the underlying resolution of the paleoclimate reconstruction, and although this has been upscaled, so you can see that actually the pixel size is a lot smaller. The underlying resolution shows through because of the, the method that they've used to upscale. So this is what we were talking about yesterday, where you take a coarse grid, you do the difference between the past coarse grid and the present coarse grid, and you add that difference to a high resolution present day. And what you end up with is these artifacts of your in your um, predicted area that is just shown through the coarse grid of the paleo plant reconstructions. Okay? Which gives us a little bit of a, uh, uncertainty in the model and may, maybe suggests that this is the true resolution that we can actually comment on rather than the upscale smaller pixel size. Okay? But then what they did is they took <coughs> these and a few others, and I don't know how many, and they stacked them on top of each other so that they could say, okay, multiple species are um, um, it, it, it was suitable for multiple species in these areas, and so there's a reasonable expectation of this being a decent forest cover. Whereas in other areas where uh, on the stack models there are essentially no large uh, uh, tree species being predicted <coughs> as present based on suitability, this suggests that there were no there was no forest in this location at the last spatial maximum. And so here we're sort of inferring uh, an area of, of refugia and areas where uh, our present day Habitat is just not suitable at all. Okay. It's the same sort of stacking that, that, that's been done for looking at future diversity patterns, but looking at past diversity patterns. Okay, and so this sort of thing has been done for um, Europe as well. Um, this is not the easiest to see. But the, the point here is um, we've got lots and lots of different observations, but this is reflecting uh, different paleoclimate reconstructions. Okay? So it's not just one reconstruction for the last spatial maximum, I think it's the last spatial maximum again. Okay? Uh, but we've got multiple reconstructions. And one approach to Viewing the uncertainty based on the different reconstructions is just to show each of them in turn. Yeah? Um, can we think of a different way that we might try to summarize these different reconstructions? Using for each mid cell standard deviation, for example. 
Yeah, so you can find some way of, of, of making some average between all of the, the uh, reconstructions and then showing that average. Uh, one, way, uh, one way is that people construct ensemble climate reconstructions. Yeah? So you can get this for um, future reconstructions and you can do it for the past as well, where you take your paleoclimate data and then you average them all and you say, well, okay, uh, here's our best guess based on all of these different reconstructions. Okay? And there's also a, a similar ensemble method where we might develop our model based on these different paleoclimate reconstructions and then take an average of the different models. Okay? So first we first of all we're sort of averaging our paleoclimate data so that we get one paleoclimate reconstruction that is in some way um, reflective of the different uncertainties in our paleoclimate data and we can model into that. Alternatively we can use our uh, original different paleoclimate reconstructions, model and project into each one in turn, and then look at our suitable habitat and then um, overlay each of our suitable habitats and then find an average based on all of our different projections into those reconstructions. Okay? So different ways of trying to uh, show our um, a best estimate based on those different paleoclimate reconstructions. Okay. And this is different from ensemble modeling where we use different algorithms and then merge those different algorithms together. Okay. But perhaps the, the most robust way is to present all of your models in all of your different scenarios, at least in your appendix yeah. or something. Nowadays, Electronic dependencies, you can have them in colour and they're free, so why not do that? Uh, uh, one question about that. What yeah. is your, your something I see like uh, you use a lot, in the, especially in the future, you can do up to 20 different yeah. GCM, and then report for every different <coughs> level. It's, it's high. Then you have switch to take an average of. Yeah, so that's, so that's one approach. Yeah. Your personal. Like I mean, in terms of in terms of you need to present this in a paper, and it's then difficult to, to you know have a table that shows twenty different modeling algorithms with twenty different reconstructions, and yeah, uh, that sort of thing isn't gonna that isn't gonna that isn't gonna present well in your paper. So you need to find some way of summarizing that, yeah, um, and. <coughs> So we've got uncertainty in the modeling algorithm we've used, we've got uncertainty in the paleoclimate reconstructions that we use, and so we, we need to make some choices about our data and our species as to what, what's the best way or what, what's the safest way to sort of present that um, uncertainty. And so we need to we need to do that on a sort of case by case basis depending on the species. So, Again, like every other answer to every question, what's the best way of doing things? It really depends on your yeah. organism. Yeah. Um, personally, I favour. I mean, I'm not a, a paleoclimatologist, so I, I don't really understand uh, that data as deeply as I could. Yeah. And so, if a paleoclimatologist can give me a some ensemble model and they say this is their best guess for that reconstruction. I'd rather use that for some of that. Yeah? Luckily there's only two for the algae and the and, and that's, the other, the, that's the other that's the other thing is that the, the, the number of reconstructions for paleoclimate is is limited, so you're unlikely to be presented with twenty different things. If you're lucky you'll get two. Okay? So here's another here's another example from the literature looking at uh, trying to search for glacial refugia. So Here's a present day reconstruction for one species, and uh, again I've completely forgotten. Um, Rodriguez Sanchez and Arroyo, 2010. Um, here's our reconstruction of our, um, no, sorry, here's our present day model of our distribution, distribution points around uh, northern Spain and uh, all along the coast. Okay, And uh, we can see that present day, 
It's quite similar, or relatively similar, to the flying sting, but the long spatial maximum, the suitability is massively reduced to just some um, coastal areas with the assumption that these are potentially good places for um, refugia from uh, the changing, the, the, the very different climate um, evident at the last special maximum. Okay, so um, we can potentially have <coughs> some interesting, um, <coughs> interesting discussion points from these models. Okay, but we need to keep in mind the uncertainties that we have when we look at these. Okay, so these are very unlikely to ever be anywhere near the truth, but they are some level of evidence, and if we've got direct evidence for the future based on fossil, then we can try to marry these two together. Okay, so when we were talking yesterday about transfers, we were talking that we need to make sure that we're transferring into climates, either in space or in time, that are similar to present day climates. If um, you're, we were, uh, what we don't want to do is to be transferring our model into climates that are very, very different to what we see today. Because we have massive uncertainty about, we don't know whether the species is going to be able to inhabit that climate because we've got no evidence either for, or, uh, uh, either for or against it because we haven't seen that particular climate in our present day. So, um, here's, here's a, an example. It, it's based on a model, but the model is reconstructing biomes rather than individual species distribution. Um, Roberts and Hunt, uh, 2012. What they did is they used present day distribution data to reconstruct biomes. Okay, so um, the top is a reconstruction of the biome at 6,000 years ago, here at 14,000 years, and here at 21,000 years, at the last virtual maximum. Plus or minus. Okay? And uh, the different colours are the different biomes. Now, they also reconstructed bio the biomes based on fossil pollen evidence. Okay? So, direct observations <coughs> of fossil pollen from the relevant time period. Okay? So, this is direct evidence of the biome being present or absent at that time period based on fossil pollen. Okay. So if we start at the top, this is the reconstruction for 6,000 years ago. This is the reconstruction based on um, uh, pollen. And we look at these and they are reasonably similar. Okay. There's no metric to, to measure the differences here, but they look reasonably similar. Okay. And what we noted for these two time frames is here we've got a temperature anomaly map. So red means very different from the present, and green means very similar to the present. Okay? So where um, climatic conditions are similar to the present, the reconstruction seems to work reasonably well. Okay? So I'm going to swap, I'm going to jump straight down to the extreme. So at 21,000 years ago, the climatic conditions were really very different to the present. Okay? And uh, the red areas are areas that are very different and don't really have any analog in present day climates. And here's the bio reconstruction using present day distribution data and present day environmental. Um, uh, preferences, and this is the reconstruction based on pollen evidence. And we look at this, and we look at this, and it's really very different. Yeah? 
And the conclusion that, 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 that uh, Roberts and Hammond make is that the difference between 21,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago is really the massive amount of difference between the present day climate and the paleo climate, and that there's no modern analog, which means that our models won't project very well, and we have a, 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 it's going to be very difficult for our models to predict uh, <coughs> a, a good paleo distributions when most of the uh, paleo climate doesn't have a modern analog. Yeah? The intermediate gives us an intermediate kind of result. So we need to, we need to understand that projecting into very different climates is very difficult for our models, particularly when yeah, um, the kind of climate scenarios we see in the past are just, there's no modern analog. So we're not going to have any presence data, we're not going to have any absence or background data for these kind of climates. So it's very difficult for us to project any model into these climates with any sort of certainty of, 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 of result. So perhaps uh, a good thing to do is when you look at your paleo climate <coughs> reconstructions, you could try and look at the background um, data to see what kind of climate conditions are similar in the present and the past and what are different and have an understanding of you know, uh, what impact it's going to have on your model when you project in, into the past. And it might be that you think that these conditions are so different that it's just not worth trying to do this. <coughs>